Well, dear colleagues, welcome to our fourth seminar in our Called in Co-Responsible series at the McGrath Institute for Church Life. Uh, the topic today is the liturgical formation of the family for co-responsibility. Uh, it's a joy to be with you. I'm Tim O'Malley, the director of McGrath Theology Online, as well as academic director of the Notre Dame Center for Liturgy here at the McGrath Institute. Uh, today, uh, we're going to dive into something that the Center for Liturgy did uh, in the summer of 2019. That's when we hosted our conference on liturgy in the domestic church. Little did we know how apropos said topic would be. In March of 2020, public liturgies were canceled throughout the U.S. because of the pandemic. Liturgy for most of us was now something celebrated in some way, shape, or form exclusively within the domestic church. From our 2019 conference, uh, to return to what we talked about, we really saw two ways that you could misunderstand what is meant by the phrase domestic church. The first is an overly romantic view of the family itself. The, the domestic church becomes the perfect Catholic family with a large van for schlepping around a harmonious brood. The home is so harmonious. It's the family rosary is shrouded in sacred silence in the evening before a lit candle and an icon of the Blessed Mother. Uh, this vision of the domestic church, right, perfectly harmonious, is so often untrue to what it's like to actually exist as families in the world, right? Uh, we, we belong to families where, where there, there isn't always harmony, um, where there's sometimes violence or anger, uh, I say this from experience as one who prays with their children every evening. So it's neither realistic, nor is it entirely infused with the gospel. It, 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 it has a, a vision of family life that is almost non-human. But second, and I, I think a danger that we often experience as well, is a dismissal of the role of family at large, right? This even happens today by well-intentioned clergy and pastoral ministers who argue that the nuclear family is a total novel, novel in, in, invention, right? Although there's truth to the claim that families didn't exist exactly as they did today, because families always exist in a social order, the claim is a bit of an exaggeration. The nuclear family, spouses and kids, have an important role to play in passing on culture, a way of life, virtues, solidarity, and justice within the home if nothing for any other reason that, that you're really close to them all the time. Uh, the problem with the nuclear family isn't that, it, that it's close to one another, it's when it takes up a kind of romanticized vision of the domestic church and makes it its own. When it turns inward, away from other social uh, bonds that are important to the world, neighbors, friends, parishes, schools, all that makes us human. So the good news, and I think the result of our conference in 2019, is that the liturgy may actually help us get the domestic church right. And thus, as we'll talk about in a bit, co-responsibility. The domestic church is a theological term. It's not a metaphor that catechists or religious educators use to empower families. It's, it's linked to opening reading today from 1 Peter, a text that John Cavadini also highlighted in his seminar. Through baptism, Christians have been ordained toward a holy priesthood in Christ. This baptismal priesthood, as St. Thomas reminds us, St. Thomas Aquinas, is ordered to the Eucharistic sacrifice. We are baptized for the Eucharist. And the people of God are Eucharistic from the beginning, meant to offer spiritual sacrifices that consecrate the entire world back to God, including the messiness and the mundaneness of family life. The domestic church in a, it is a particular way and not the exclusive way. It, you know, by domestic church, of course, we mean uh, families, uh, but it's not the only way that one lives this baptized life. Uh, there's myriad ways of doing it, but the domestic church is a particular way that families participate in the consecration of the world back to the Father. When COVID-19 ended public liturgies, 
I often heard a lot of very well-intentioned people mistakenly say that mass has been canceled. The Eucharist is gone. This is bad Eucharistic theology and it's bad for co-responsibility. The Eucharist continued right through the sacrifice of the mass uh, offered in parishes uh, where we couldn't be at the time. It continued through the substantial presence of Christ in the blessed sacrament and in those concrete offerings of Eucharistic love found in families that could not receive the body and blood of our Lord at the time. So the domestic church is Eucharistic, not only when it's attending mass, which of course is a good, but in its very identity, when it offers those spiritual sacrifices through prayer, through bearing one another's burdens, through all those concrete mundane acts of love that make up family life. So what makes family life Eucharistic for the most part is not its stunning drama. It's the materiality of the whole thing. When you have children, you are no longer allowed to love in the abstract anymore. You are required to love in the often painfully concrete, the very material. The child who rises in the middle of the night is an occasion for the parent to show mercy. For hours, you sit in the playroom with that same child and do the same puzzles over and over again. The act of forgiveness within the family, of taking correction, right? My spouse corrects me often enough. And uh, that correction is only possible when the family shares a deep communion with one another so that you don't immediately respond in kind. Um, now let me offer to you a list of things that make you a horrible human being. And this communion is shared insofar as we welcome into our home the suffering, the sick, the elderly, all those in the world, right, that the family's love can sustain grandparents and great-grandparents uh, and all those who are looking for love. And yet it's these concrete acts of love that allow the family to become an image of communion, right? So through the liturgy, the family receives this love and it's cultivated within the family through these concrete practices, often, especially when it's difficult. So this concrete sacrificial love, this Eucharistic dimension of the domestic church does not mean that the family no longer needs liturgy. The point is that the family is not created for itself, for its own consumption and production, for private experiences of perfect harmony. The family is created for sacrificial love, to become this love. The Eucharist, the devotional life, the liturgy of the hours, the rosary, uh, each of these is intended to allow the family to become what it is, a communion of love given to a neighbor, to a city, to a rural hamlet as a Eucharistic gift, and that when the family ex exercises this vocation, the family is already co-responsible for the mission of the church, as our previous panelists have addressed in this series. Now, of course, all of this has been complicated in the age of COVID-19. We can no longer rely on the family as an agent of co-responsibility by assuming that everyone is gonna make it to mass every week. So I don't know what to do about this. Thus, I invited two of my brilliant friends and colleagues to help us all think through how to think about families and to form families for co-responsibility, for consecrating the mundane in our current situation. So I'll introduce them, uh, not immediately both, uh, I'll introduce them right before they speak so you remember their name and can look up any of their publications. Uh, so I wanna first introduce Dr. Karen Schadel. Uh, Karen is the Director of the Office of Worship for the Archdiocese of Louisville, and she has a PhD from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill and Musicology. Incidentally, she is a torn person rooting for both Kentucky basketball and North Carolina basketball, evidence that you can have in one person um, sort of a, a, a soul ripped in two different directions. <laughs> um, previously, she worked at Bellarmine University as an assistant campus minister in charge of chapel liturgies, where she was a mentor uh, to many of our students, in, uh, to several of our students at least in ECHO, who are graduates of Bellarmine. So they knew Karen there, and that's how we knew of her. Um, she's married, she's a mother, and 
As many of us became the spring after school shut down, she's now become an expert in the art of homeschooling. Um, I've asked Karen to give some remarks related to our topic based on her work in the Archdiocese of Louisville. Thanks, Karen, for being here. Hey, everybody. Thanks, Tim, for that introduction. Um, it has really been wonderful to be a part of this discussion over the past couple weeks about co-responsibility and the church's mission that we all share together. Um, I will say that a couple of weeks ago, during Professor Cavadini's exposition of this topic and that guiding document, the, um, the address from Pope Benedict to the Diocese of Rome, uh, when he was speaking, I felt particularly challenged myself by his distinction between lay ecclesial ministry and the laity more broadly. So as someone myself who's a lay person who works for the church, and especially as a lay woman um, who, you know, at least in diocesan administration, is still, I think it's fair to say, a, a fairly heavily male and clerical world, I always uh, cast myself as the good guy <laughs> in the narrative. Uh, I represent the people. Um, but I think this concept of co-responsibility challenges me. Um, challenges us even a lay ecclesial ministers to ask okay am i just imposing programs and formation and prayer opportunities based on my own vision of what the mission of the church is and then asking for the mere participation of the laity or am i truly seeking a relationship with the laity who don't work with the church which is most of them um, but are equally co-responsible for this mission so I will say I appreciate that challenge. I think it's gonna make me a better minister. It's gonna make me better at my work. And so I hope some of you are, are maybe feeling some of that too uh, that have been along for the ride a couple of weeks here. So I thought I could just add a little bit to this discussion from my perspective as a diocesan director of worship here in Louisville, a musician, a parent, just a human being. Um, I think the question before us is this. Um, if the liturgy is the source and summit of our life in Christ, and we all believe that that is true, then how does it reinforce the co-responsibility of each person for the mission of the church? Or if you want to look at that question more evaluatively, how well or how poorly does our celebration of the liturgy point us to that co-responsible mission? Are the choices that we make getting in the way, or are they fostering co-responsibility. And again, I'm taking that broad definition of laity. So I'm not just talking about the choices of the people who prepare the liturgy, like liturgists, musicians, clergy, other liturgical ministers. Their work is perhaps, you know, it's got an obvious impact on how the liturgy is celebrated. But I'm talking about the whole church here. Um, so towards the end of that address uh, by Pope Benedict, he says the following. I'm just going to read a couple sentences to you. Through faith in God, we are united in the body of Christ and all become united in the same body. Thus, precisely by profoundly believing, we may achieve communion among ourselves and emerge from the loneliness of individualism. The loneliness of individualism is a phrase that really struck me. He goes on. The church, therefore, is not the result of an aggregation of individuals but of unity among those who are nourished by the one word of God and the one bread of life. So I bet um, some of you have seen these virtual choirs. Have you all seen these on, on various social media? Uh, they're really popular right now. You get like that uh, Brady Bunch grid of people and they're each doing their own uh, little part in isolation and then someone at a computer mixes it all together. Um, and honestly, it, it is pretty cool. It is super neat what technology can do with that. Um, but if you have ever participated in one of these choirs, you know that it is kind of tricky. Um, you have like a click, click track that you're listening to in your headphones. And then you're trying to, you know, listen to that and sing your part into your phone and look at your phone and look normal while you're doing that. Um, and the track has to be pretty straight ahead in terms of tempo to keep everyone together when you mix it. So there's really no room for rubato or slowing down or that nuance that you would get from a real choir. And uh, those of you who've been in a real choir, you know that it, it sort of uh, becomes its own organism. It breathes and moves and slows down and speeds up and gets louder and softer and goes flat together and gets sharp together um, as one. And then you rely on the stronger singers to sort of help the weaker ones along. So I would argue that a virtual choir, while very cool, is a very additive process. So it is that aggregation of individuals 
to use Benedict's language. So each individual just adds their contribution to the stack and you just have to hope that they observe the breath marks and sing the music correctly and it's an aggregate. So it, it lacks something essential, I would argue. Similarly, with the church at prayer in the liturgy, it's not just an aggregation, right? It's not just adding your holiness to my holiness, to his holiness, to the priest's holiness. And uh, if we stick with that mathematics, mathematics metaphor, you know, the operation is not addition, it really is multiplication. Elsewhere, Benedict uses the term leaven, right? That the stronger members are like leaven that enliven the whole, uh, make it grow, multiply the holiness rather than just adding it all together. So like the yeast and the flour, the whole thing just overflows. So again, the question, how do we celebrate the mass formatively so that there is this multiplication of holiness and not just addition, if you will. Um, it is our hope that the laity would encounter Christ in the liturgy and that that encounter would multiply and overflow into every part of our lives. So instead of just bracketing out our God time on Sunday and then getting back to life, but really taking the mission of the church and living that out in our families, how, we, uh, how are we fostering that in the liturgy? Or maybe are we actually getting in the way of that sometimes? So we could talk about, you know, dozens of examples of what I mean by a liturgy that forms us for co-responsibility, but I thought I would just share, throw out one observation during these strange uh, liturgical times that we are currently in. So when we think about the lay people doing the mission of the church, we might naturally be drawn to the dismissal at the end of mass. Go and announce the gospel. Go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your life. Get out of here. Go be the church out there. And that's right, um, but I would say that lately I have been thinking more about the opposite end of the liturgy, the gathering rite, and how that forms us for our mission as the church. Um, I have been back to Mass post shutdown, I think three times to Sunday Mass, um, and one change that we have recommended across the Archdiocese of Louisville during this time is a pretty uh, common sense one. Um, we, we have asked that you interact as little as possible in those gathering spaces, uh, narthexes or narthesis, whatever that word is, um, and that any ritualized greeting, such as turn to your neighbor and wish them all good morning, we're, we've asked that to be eliminated. Pretty common sense during this time. So there's no sort of organized welcome team. And so the experience of coming to mass right now is really just entering and having a seat. I expect that is really hard for some people. And to be honest, it's a little hard for me uh, not to strike up that conversation or exchange a hug or whatever. Um, but what I find is that it really is re-ritualizing that act of gathering those introductory rites. It's actually restored real meaning to the introductory rites. That it's in our common prayer and actions united internally and externally um, to Christ that we gather as one, not in the smiling and shaking hands and the chit chat. All of that is well and good. Please don't misunderstand me. I know it will come back uh, to some degree, although I have to sidebar and say that I know I'm not supposed to enjoy anything about the post COVID worship, but introvert me very much appreciates that freedom from having to wear the social face to mass. I know you know what I'm talking about, right? I think sometimes with the liturgy, the church can do a better job of recognizing the full range of the human experience and here we get a little to what Tim was talking about with the, the sort of almost non-human type of interaction. Uh, you know, <laughs> how, how human is it really to shout good morning at someone? You know, it's, it's, it's almost subhuman. Uh, we know life is not always like that, at least not all the time. And so you should not need to put on the happy social face. You can if you want to. But I often wonder how that seeks to welcome the lost and lonely, what it feels like to enter that church if you suffer from anxiety or depression. Um, and this is where I think we can just really be so radically countercultural. My experience sometimes with a variety of Christian faith traditions is that they tend to map other social models onto the church experience. So church is like a social club, church is like a neighborhood, church is like a community meeting, church is like a concert. Um, I wonder if we evangelize more fruitfully um, sometimes when our liturgy welcomes the full range of human experience, all the ways of being human. Um, so I felt a particular freedom from needing to put on the church face 
And I think that has uh, made me free to worship more authentically in these last uh, few Sundays. It didn't have to be a good morning. It could be a bad morning. It could be a frustrated morning or whatever. Um, back to Benedict's phrase, the loneliness of individualism. It is only by our communion and unified professed belief that we can break free of that loneliness of individualism. I'm sitting further and further apart from the people than ever. Uh, we are interacting less than ever, but in a really a, a real way, I do feel closer to them than ever. It's that shared belief, that shared conviction. That's just been my experience. I don't know if others share it. I think our liturgy does this naturally. Sometimes we just have to step out of the way. As Catholics, we know that we are people of Lent and Easter. Yes, but also within any one liturgy, there is that richness, right? We are people of the penitential rite and the Gloria, right next to each other. Uh, you could look, of course, at the Book of Psalms, which is, you know, the source of responsorial psalmody, of course, and a lot of our proper antiphons. Uh, one of the earliest translators of the Psalms into English metered poetry, William Tansor, called the Book of Psalms the anatomy of the soul, Right, this was, this was in the 18th century uh, when the science of anatomy was really taking off and people were cutting into cadavers and, and wow, there's more than blood and bones in here. There's, there's all kinds of stuff in here. Uh, the whole range of being human, the whole human experience, the anatomy of the soul is found. All those different types of relationships with God, it's all in there. And I think we do well to acknowledge that depth of human experience, which really provides, I think, a, a sturdier for foundation than that sometimes superficial social dimension of gathering for mass. We could talk about a, a bunch of other examples, and I hope that maybe y'all in the chat uh, could put forth some other ideas uh, through your questions. Uh, but I would say as we are navigating this time back to church together, none of us asked for this set of circumstances, uh, but if I could be positive about it, I would encourage us all to see this as an opportunity to look at how we gather how we send forth, how we celebrate, and ask ourselves, is that reinforcing a co-responsible mission? Or alternately, if we are impeding that common mission, how might we reform our practices to get us there? Great, uh, thank you so much, Karen, uh, and especially for the very, uh, fecund image of the Psalms as an anatomy of the soul. Uh, I, I, I suspect we will go back to that uh, when we go into our chats. Just a note, uh, the way that this uh, breakouts are going to go, you, you can put questions into the chat box. Uh, after our next presenter, Doc, uh, Dr. Harmon, uh, we're going to send you into groups to gather up questions. Um, you don't have to have answers for them yourselves then. Uh, but then we'll return to the group to share those questions and have a, a pretty lengthy conversation with our two panelists. Um, so just put, put questions you have into the chats as we move along. Thanks, Karen. Uh, so I'm happy now to introduce Dr. Katherine Harmon, Assistant Professor of Theology at Marion University in Indianapolis. Uh, as a scholar, Katie focuses on forgotten dimensions of the American liturgical movement uh, of the late 19th through mid 20th century. Uh, while many of us know about the liturgical movement related to the reform of the liturgy, we might be surprised to discover how important the domestic sphere and, the, and actually the, the public sphere was to this renewal. Um, I, I think based upon the topic we've been considering around co-responsibility, uh, that what Dr. Harmon has done, what Katie has done in her work is retrieve something essential that all of us need to think about. The place you can get uh, uh, Katie's work most clearly is her book, There Were Also Many Women There, Lay Women in the Liturgical Movement in the United States, 1926 through 1959. Um, Katie is a personal dear friend. Uh, we once shared an apartment in graduate school in which um, I was an extrovert and she was an introvert, and that was an interesting moment. And she is, uh, uh, she's mom to two kids and spouse to Matt, who is also a friend of mine from graduate school. So it's a joy to have uh, Katie here to talk to us a little bit about some insights relative to our topic from her own research in the liturgical movement. Thanks, Katie. Yes, thank you, Tim. And many thanks to everyone at the Institute uh, for Church Life, the McGrath Institute, and the Center for Liturgy for the invitation. It's such a joy to be here. Uh, thank you to all of you who are virtually gathered here uh, with us to talk and explore this idea 
re-explore this idea of co-responsibility of the lay faithful in the life of the church. And more specifically, I might say the role that lay people have in living this liturgical life. I have been asked to reflect briefly on the history of the liturgical movement. As Tim mentioned, that's what my book focused on, and a lot of my work focuses on this era known as the liturgical movement. Uh, for those of you who aren't as familiar with that term, it doesn't refer to liturgical dance, but rather it refers to an era of liturgical and spiritual renewal which animated the Roman Catholic Church, as well as a number of our, a number of our Protestant brothers and sisters beginning in the 19th century and culminating in those liturgical reforms which followed after the Second Vatican Council. Uh, the reforms of the council, of course, didn't come from nowhere, but rather from decades of lay women and men working together co-responsibly, if you will, with their pastors, with their religious men and women, other church leaders, to advocate for active participation in liturgical worship. The liturgical movement, though, didn't have this simple goal of people praying better together. It was not interested in just simply rubrics and knowing them well. In fact, a reclaiming of the liturgy at that time was precisely the opposite. Liturgy had sort of been subsumed into thinking, oh, if I, if I know what all of the red words say, then I'm going to be okay, but rather opening up liturgy in a deeper, more profound and powerful way, one which was truly transformative. And indeed, the advocates of a liturgical movement had as their goal transformation of the world in love of Christ. For advocates of the liturgy, they believed that the world would come to know Christ through the liturgy of his church. And the world would only come to know the liturgy of the church through exposure to it. It might seem odd to think people weren't exposed to the liturgy, but because of language barriers, because of different practices regarding how people participated in ritual or even received communion, people weren't as deeply entrenched in the ritual of the Mass itself, as, as, as Karen, my co-presenter, was saying, uh, as we have the gift of being so today. Liturgical movement advocates sought to help people intellectually and spiritually grasp the experience of liturgical prayer as formation in the body of Christ. This formation was realized, that is made real, not simply in just receiving communion during mass, but in the utter transformation of the faithful to become more active members of Christ's body in the world. This came through living as Christ in the world, through literal care for the poor and advocating for just wages, through sustainable agriculture, through standing up to and opposing racial injustice when it was an extraordinarily unpopular to do so, to teaching children uh, in the schools or at home with compassion and patience, and to arguing against the pressures of consumerism as driving one's life. All of these things, liturgical movement sought to call people to the touchstones of the Paschal mystery, the incarnation, God's love. So a pretty simple goal, right? So more specifically, maybe, advocates of liturgical renewal tended to focus their efforts on a few particular areas, one of which was liturgical practice itself, uh, participating in the communal prayer of the mass or the divine office, the liturgy of the hours, interest in something called the dialogue mass, that is the mass spoken aloud, people saying the responses, not just the altar servers, with their priest presider, uh, the use of a missal and the breviary, books to actually access the texts of what was happening ritually, as well as greater familiarity with the lectionary texts and the readings and the psalms. Another area of interest was the liturgical arts, uh, the wonderful uh, retrieval of liturgical music, uh, and an interest in retrieving ancient Christian symbols, uh, which might inform the arts and decor of a church, and greater attention to church architecture such as where does your baptismal font, uh, where is it located, uh, how can that speak more loudly of the baptismal priesthood of all. Another area uh, was social activism and education, and these might be strange to think of as angles of a liturgical movement, but they very much are. Uh, applying liturgy to real life meant being socially responsible and active and responding to all of the terrible things going on in the 20th century, from wars and racism and uh, oppression of different persons. Liturgical movement sees itself as a, as, a, as a salt, as a balm, as a response to the problems of individualism 
consumerism, all of the isms of the modern world. I'd pair with that this interest in education, both with increased education access in the entirety US context uh, of persons and of Catholics in particular, there's a great drive to sort of delve deeply into the intellectual traditions, theology and the sciences and philosophy. How are these, uh, uh, how can these provide a Catholic outlook on life? Even magazines, which we might know today, like Commonweal, these become forum for uh, Catholics engaging the world. Finally, another area in which liturgical movement advocates were interested was family life, that is the domestic life. Uh, introducing children and families as a whole to this liturgical life. Advocates who were interested in the family maintained that a life radically formed by the liturgy should not just be left to the realm of experts, if you will, uh, but could be uh, to those who didn't have the freedom to pray the entire office every day. Liturgical movement advocates were looking for the integration of family life, the very mundane, with the liturgical and sacramental world. And it's this last area that I just wanna say another word about because the home life to which so many of us have been quite literally bound in these past couple of months is such a powerful location for human and family formation. This living the lay apostolate, as they might've said, or as we might say now, being co-responsible in the life of the church it's not just something for experts. All the faithful are called to consecrate the mundane, that which is of the world, and to recognize how the whole world, including small, wriggling, chaos-inducing, messy children, point us to God. Indeed, women, particularly active in the liturgical movement, chose to sacramentalize life and work within the home precisely because they saw it as a resistance to secularism and the breakdown of family life. Advocates, uh, often lay women, as I mentioned, who were wives and mothers of children, wrote about, spoke about, gave lectures and were on panels like these about how to recognize resonances between feeding a family of Christ and feeding the 5,000. How simple practices like constructing an advent wreath out of real cut branches from your backyard and hanging it over your dining room table, what could go wrong, uh, but how these things could help children physically experience Christ's light growing closer, and how attending mass as a family, instead of having mom you know, go off to early mass to cook breakfast for you later, or have the kids sit in the kids' pew, or dad go up to the choir, but a family sitting together might be a powerful symbol for everyone to experience the mass and its formation together. How do we see these things in the mass, in the, in the prayers of the church, as shaping us to compassion, to care for creation, to loving those ones who drive us crazy sometimes. How can the liturgy shape our little domestic church? These women's work still exist today and you can find them through a simple search online, but perhaps I'd like to say, how can we be shaped further by their example in the present? How do we in this terrible blessed year of 2020 take up this mantle of being active participants in liturgical life in the home. We know that active participation in the liturgy doesn't do us any good if we turn around and ignore our neighbor or our spouse or our child or our parent or our enemy. We have a rich history of heroes in the faith who have gone before us, folks who advocated for liturgical renewal so passionately. But the point in looking at history isn't just to admire sort of fossilized, perfected icons hanging on the wall, but to recognize patterns into which we can step, into which we can adjust and improve upon and continue in this sort of continual call, our Christian call, to transform the world into the light of Christ. Thank you. What we'll do now is we'll just have conversation uh, for around the next 30 or so minutes. And uh, just like we've done with past ones, we'd love for you to be able to ask the question yourself. And so uh, you'll be unmuted and be able to ask that question. But our first question uh, came up is from Peg McAvoy. I guess uh, my question, if I can remember it all, um, is that um, the Eucharist is source and summit. And, and I absolutely believe that. And I, and it's um, very much a part of my own um, 
obviously faith, but spirituality as well. But at the same time, it seems like our typical parish has what seems like an almost soul focus on the, the celebration of the Eucharist and that, that can create a barrier for uh, people who come to us with impediments um, to uh, you know, the full participation, full communion. Um, and my question is, has this time of focus on the domestic church during the time of COVID um, taught us anything that can help us overcome these uh, barriers to full participation and should it? All right, panelists, what do you think? I can jump in here. Um, I, I think the obvious answer is yes, we have learned something. <laughs> um, what it is, I think, is, is tricky. Um, I would say from my perspective, you know, just being home, even with the kids and the family so much, um, and without having a whole lot of entertainment in the usual sense for my family. So, you know, March is a month where we watch basketball and that's it. Like we don't do anything else. And so absent that, uh, you know, we had just a lot of free time. And I think we had to learn some, uh, some uh, family <laughs> contemplative skills, I guess. I did a lot of puzzles. Um, and I, I think there's a lesson there for the liturgy as well. I think a lot of our parishes have, have sort of forcibly is a little strong, but, but the liturgy has turned a little bit contemplative just out of necessity, right? There's more silence. There's perhaps more instrumental improvisation. Um, there is silence when we might have been singing. Um, simple repetition, um, depending on the parish, that could be a really foreign thing. I do think that does help shape the assembly toward a deeper encounter with Christ. Maybe that's too hot of a take. Um, but I, I think that if we exercise that contemplative muscle, and again, I would stress that, that contemplation doesn't necessarily mean silence. So I'm thinking of myself with my kids at Mass, you know, there's going to be noise, but, but that interior silence if we exercise that muscle enough, I think it trains us to be naturally encountering Christ outside of the liturgy. So, uh, you know, in a, a walk outside around the block, um, in cooking dinner, in talking to our children, in talking to our spouse, I think we're more primed to encounter Christ in those everyday interactions if we have a, a contemplative liturgy, I guess. That's what I would say about that. Yeah, thanks. I would I would agree with that. And and I would add to that maybe a little bit of a retrieval or rethinking about what source and summit means. Because if the Eucharist is the source and summit, well, the source and summit, well, maybe that's here. I know we all have our own images, but there's a space between wherever you were and that source and summit. And so what are all the other things that bring you to the Eucharist or, or draw you towards the Eucharist? Is it kindness and, you know, interacting with your family member? Is it taking a walk and enjoying God's creation? How are all of these other things, how are they pointing us to the Eucharistic experience? And all of us, regardless of, you know, our age or whatever, can participate in the beauty of God's creation or compassion towards our neighbor. I think it's, it offers a sort of way of reminding us that the Eucharist is the sort of exclamation point, the affirmation, the again of that life in Christ. So I think it's a great question. Thanks. Peg, the, uh, just so you know, this is one of the things we'll be taking up uh, next week as well, precisely on this topic around devotional life. Uh, and uh, certainly within my own family, uh, we found a new restoration of various devotional practices that necessarily arose during this time. Uh, in which we weren't able to attend the Eucharist and our children are actually still not able to go uh, regularly. Uh, so we will pick that up next week. Uh, we'll return to your question uh, again then. Uh, I want to uh, now turn to uh, Bridget Passeur, uh, who wants to ask a question about uh, the church's understanding of the family. Bridget, you're up. Yes, thank you very much. Um, and thank you uh, on behalf of our group had people from England and uh, Canada and the United States. So we were very international, but very uh, joined in our, in our discussion on this. We as domestic church often define the family as nuclear. And yet when we look at our 
uh, families in the pew are children under uh, catechesis, that is not what family looks like any, any longer. How are we approaching that in allowing liturgy to speak to all the people, not just how we traditionally have defined family? Thank you. Yeah, at least historically, there's a little bit of awareness that there's a, maybe a little bit of artificiality to how we understand the family. And even like the notion of two parents and a, and a couple of kids, that's an artificial notion. Like the family wasn't really understood to be that way until like the 1950s and the sort of consumer popular culture created that, that, that vision. But you're absolutely right. Families don't look like that, either in history in the past or in the present. And so the same thing with these notions of like, you know, praying together or doing things in your home or the way you attend your food. It could be a group of friends or say it's roommates in school who live together or an extended family. They can operate in the same way. I think one of the maybe um, key things to think about is when we think about the domestic church is not to assume there are sort of gender specific roles that, you know, mom is there doing the cooking and dad is doing this and the kids are doing this, but it could be aunts living together or it could be whoever, it could be friends. I think removing the sort of assumptions culturally about gender allows us to think more broadly about what these units, social units might look like. A domestic church doesn't necessarily mean you know, mom, dad, 2.5 kids or 1.3, whatever it is. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that there's much um, I could add to that other than uh, to double back on the point that I think the more the church emphasizes the depth of what it means to be human, as opposed to one way of being human, uh, that sort of idealized uh, family, idealized person, the happy, you know, I'm here to worship, you know, I want to participate. Like we have an ideal participant in the liturgy. The more that we broaden that and, and look at the whole range of what it means to be human through our preaching, you know, through our, our uh, practices, our liturgical practices, I think the more uh, welcoming in a true sense, okay, not just the shaking hands at the door, but welcoming in a true sense that we are as a church. All right, uh, now uh, we have Sister Gina, uh, who is going to ask a question. Uh, well, I, I lost the question, but she's gonna ask a question. Let me see if I can find the question too. Um, yeah, basically I'm asking about, I, I appreciated Karen's words about noting in lit liturgy this gathering and this sending forth. And it seems like when we talk about the domestic church and we talk about being family, we're focused very much on what does it mean to be a holy family together in the home or showing up in the pew at church. But I, I'm kind of curious about how are we able to form families for that sending forth dynamic, perhaps post COVID, but even now um, in terms of what does it mean to be able to send families forth to be working for the poor or for working for justice? Um, what does it look like when families are sent forth um, and how do we prepare them for that? In my own experience, I think we had the pretty strong home life, but I, I don't know that I was prepared to do the outward focus until later and that formation came some other way. So I'm just curious what that could look like. Yeah, it's a tough question. <laughs> um, I, Katie may have uh, some better insights than this, but I will just say that um, I do feel that a lot of parish um, ministries do not cater to families. Let me just put it that way. Okay, they, they do not cater to family schedules, family life, family needs. Um, and I do think parishes could do some real soul searching on some of that to see how they could reach out to groups beyond old ladies, you know, when they're thinking about ministries. Okay, um, I, I think that is the first step and I'll just leave it there. Yeah, I was thinking, of, I agree, it is a hard question, and thank you, Sister Gina, for it. I was thinking kind of on the other side. I was thinking about my own experience in my family, and how do our kids maybe experience, you know, are they prepared to go up to a stranger or offer care in some way? And now, I don't want my children talking to strangers, but pretend that was okay. Um, practice, I think, even the, sort of practicing the exercise of being polite, of not being selfish, of offering help. Like that might be one way 
in groups that you knew, like say it's your family group or whatever social unit you're in, but to practice that, uh, you know, that attitude of care and compassion. Like my daughter will say, you know, hi to the parade of people walking by our house and, you know, in the, in the, on the path back here. And she doesn't know them, but she's offering hospitality. And so I feel like practice cultivated in different ways would be another maybe element to add to that. Uh, now we uh, have uh, F Father John Reagan from, if I'm correct, uh, Joliet. That's correct. Yep. Uh, so actually, I'm reporting from our our group. The question was, um, most of our conversation was about like, practical aspects of of promoting. And encouraging the domestic church. So the question was, um, are there catechetical moments either before or after or during the celebration of mass that can be used to encourage the domestic church? And so just looking for practical suggestions. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, in terms of looking at the mass, the mass isn't just one moment in time. Uh, we blessedly have access to all of these texts, right? And the lectionary and the word, um, both in history and in the present, I personally find it helpful to either look at the, say, the lectionary readings uh, before Mass happens, because when Mass is happening, I may or may not be able to focus on what's happening because I have small children doing things. Uh, so that being one sort of, we don't just hear the word in that one moment, but we prepare our hearts for it. Maybe we digest it afterwards as, as well. So with access to texts, that might be one thing we could do. Uh, similarly, say you do have some sort of like, home prayer or a family prayer or other devotional moment with whoever you're with, uh, you could draw that prayer, you could draw upon the, the texts of the liturgy or the prayers, just to hear those words again. I know I'm a little text focused, but I feel like because we have access to these things in, you know, vernacular languages, it's a great gift. And to make greater use of that than that just that moment of speeding by when we hear it orally, but just to digest it more. Uh, we, just to give one example, we have worked with our priests here in the archdiocese uh, on, on how to get more silence into the liturgy where it is called for. And one of the things we've worked with them on is let us pray, which should then be followed by a silence before you launch into the collect. Um, and we have instructed them that that is one of those moments that you're speaking of. So our family, uh, we're in this uh, situation, like I think Tim mentioned this, where the kids are not my oldest is coming to mass with us when we go, but the younger, the three-year-old is not um, for COVID reasons and whatnot. Um, but in the car on the way to mass, we say, who do we need to pray for today? And that's just a conversation that we have. Who needs our prayers? What situation needs our prayers? And then if the priest does the thing where he says, let us pray and then waits, then what we should be doing is calling to mind those things, those people that need our prayers. So that's just one small example of, I think what Katie's talking about. Yeah, one of the one of the things that I want to sort of just add to this is um, how important it is to, uh, in some ways, forming your kids and forming yourselves for preparation of mass is essential. But no matter what formation you do, uh, as most families, I, I know that there's a lot of talk about the nuclear family and like as the nuclear family is the perfect family. But the thing about family life is that. It's a relatively complicated reality for nuclear families and non-nuclear families. I think but we often forget that. We, we tend to sort of say like, well, if you have 2.5 children and a mom and a dad, your life is normal. Life is not normal for human beings, right? Uh, things fall apart. Um, I'm looking at one of my colleagues. Sometimes uh, uh, lightning strikes your house. And um, this happened to, 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 to this person and I, I'm looking at them. So, you know, it's actually really hard, I think, to, to like prepare yourself for the fullness of the Eucharistic sacrifice in the midst of, of daily life. And that's why I think uh, sort of part of this catechesis is to be like really giving parents empowerment that they actually can pray with their kids and have an obligation to do so, right? So the tools that you need to do it are okay, why can't you chant with your kids? It's not complicated things. Like you don't need, uh, we don't need a, you don't need the graduale, but, but you can sort of do sort of basic chants or 
your obligation to pass on the essential sung prayers of the tradition. You know, my children are seven and three is important to me that they know the Marian antiphons of the church by the time that they get to school. And if we sing them at home, they pick them up. This is not uh, material embodied stuff, but it's all preparation for the liturgical life. Um, you, you know, even modeling genuflection, right? My children learn to genuflect not because we had a formalized class on it. So, so there's all these kinds of things. I think the more that we empower uh, those who are in charge of raising kids, moms, dads, grandparents, aunts, uncles, to uh, sort of incarnate and enflesh this, the better off we are, right? So that's part of the catechesis that's rather material. Um, okay, uh, Tara Stanger has a question as well. Tara, you're up. Thank you. Um, my question, it kind of takes it from the next point. You're talking about empowering families. I want to know from the parish side, I think families often expect that people want them to be that romanticized version of the domestic church that you were talking about earlier, Tim, about acting all pious and sitting properly and being quiet. And I also have a seven and three year old and that is not our lived reality. So any suggestions on how to help families embrace that their lived experience is welcome, needed, and celebrated, as well as how to, any tips for parishes on how to model this so families know that we want that, you're welcome, come be here. I've had a lot of uh, uh, interesting discussions about cry rooms with people, the pros and cons, right? So at the, at, at, on one end, the cry room says, we care about you parents, we understand your needs, here's this wonderful special place for you, but at the same time, it says, please be separate, separated from the rest of us, you know. So it's got this weird dual message to it. Um, and so I'm not going to, I'm not going to come down on, on the pro or con of that. But I, I will just say that, you know, um, I appreciate uh, Cardinal Seurat's uh, text on silence from a couple years ago, I think, uh, where he really talks about how silence is not the absence of noise. And that's just kind of been a mantra for me with my own kids that, uh, that children in liturgy do not detract from the internal uh, closeness with Christ and that experience of others. And I think any way that a church can um, reinforce that is good. I think from the parent perspective, similar to what Tim was saying a moment ago, uh, we don't have to understand everything, right? We don't have to understand every word of scripture uh, we don't have to even be tuned in, for goodness sake. I know I'm brain dead for sometimes my brain goes numb during whatever part of the mass. The liturgy does a lot of things naturally. It's good to come prepared, but also that just sort of washes over you sometimes, and there's goodness in that. And I think sometimes we overemphasize the understanding and not the experience. And I think liturgy is very experiential. And as a family, like your kids will get something out of it, even if they don't understand a single word. You know, there's, they, they understand this is important to mom and dad, if nothing else. They know that this is an important time. Um, so those are just a few things. Yeah, I, I would agree. And I would, I would sort of add to that, maybe speaking from experience too. I have an almost three-year-old and an almost nine-month-old and it's such a joy. Uh, here we are. Um, but the way that we've been treated when we go to mass makes a big difference in terms of how we're identified or encouraged or given the eye, if you know what I mean, when we're, when we're there as a family and our daughter's running around or whatever's happening. But I think it's a, a real co-responsible sort of action of the pastor, you know, maybe making, even making a comment, thanking the parents for having their kids there, or the ministers who are present ministers of hospitality, making sure that families, if they want, can be seated, helping them find seats for mom carrying a bit heavy baby carrier or whatever. And for the other congregants gathered there, it makes a big difference whether someone smiles and is like, yeah, I've been there, or hands you like a pack of crayons, pretend there was no COVID, or if they turn around and give you a sort of look. And so there's, I think, a really layered responsibility of the whole gathered church to maybe welcome those families who are there to encourage us. And I do the same. I try now, too, uh, to look at other families with a lot of compassion, compassion I never had before until I had a family. Thank you, Tara. Okay, so we have time for one last question, and there's, a, there's many. So many of you, your questions have not been uh, fielded, uh, mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. 
Uh, but uh, I wanted to sort of call on Father Dave Crum. So I just raised the question about um, in this time of social distancing, how can we as participants in the liturgy um, do our best to make sure there isn't emotional distancing? I find, uh, you know, as a presider, um, for me, I miss all the social things that go with the liturgy, as perhaps many of you do as well. And sometimes I find that um, people come to church to receive the Eucharist, but others in the assembly are seen with a hermeneutic of suspicion because they may be sick or, or whatever. And so there's this emotional distancing that can happen and I think if, whether it's individuals or families, um, how do we model that really the assembly is the primary symbol of the Eucharist and of the church? And, um, and even to speak about it outside of the mass, you know, a lot of people um, will speak about being absent from the sacrament, but I think sometimes the church fails to tell them that even though they could not get in to receive the seven, out in the world, they were the sacrament. They, the church is the sacrament of the world. So when you were helping your children with your schooling online and uh, being family and doing devotionals, as you know, here in New Orleans, kids made stations of the cross and they put them on the tree belts and neighbors came and prayed them. That was being sacrament. So for me, it's like, how do we bridge that really tenuous thing about social distancing and make sure that the liturgy doesn't become another place of emotional distance? Yeah, I, I definitely hear that um, from others. And I, I think it is an important thing to keep in mind. Um, it, it does matter who the person is, though, because as I was describing in my talk, I think um, even though it's weird, I do feel like weirdly close to the people that are there at mass because we're, you know, we just have those knowing stares <laughs> at each other. Um, and so there is a real emotional closeness there. It's hard to describe. It's not the same as going up and hugging and talking about how's your mother and all this. Um, and for me, there's more depth in a certain way, whereas the other is a little more superficial. However, I think your point is really valid. Um, I think maybe one thing we could do to bridge that gap is to uh, let the laity know that you know you're a priest but you are not the designated prayer the only person that can do prayer so like you know i can't interact with you but i can go home and, and touch and hug and hold my family so those are the people i can have that physical intimacy with so how can i pray with them um, as the office of worship you know the director of the office of worship a lot of times other agencies will call me and say you know, I need, I need a prayer service for, for an opening prayer for this meeting we're having. Great, do it. You know, I'm not the designated prayer for the whole diocese. You, you can pray. You can do that on your own. I'm, I'm glad to help you. So I think that sort of empowering of, of families and lay people to do prayer on their own with the people they can hold in touch at a time when we can't hold in touch each other um, or even shake hands, you know, or even be close. Uh, in the liturgy might be one way of getting around that. But yeah, it is, I, I hear what you're saying. It is a struggle, especially for people who are, who uh, rely on their time at church as one of those key moments of community, one of those key anchors of community in their life that may not have the family community. It is really important for them. Yeah, I, I agree with Karen, and I, thank you for your question. I think it is really potent about how the faithful can be the sacrament, sacraments in the world. And I think one thing is something it sounds like you're doing is that in affirming uh, the sacramental capabilities of people, because sacraments aren't just the seven sacraments. There's that sacramental worldview, which, which where Catholics are blessed. But I, I actually have another angle I was thinking about, because even if you're not there in Mass, I actually have not been to Mass in, in person since Lent three. And it's been really, really hard. I'm a church musician and I can't play. It's like this whole life of me is missing. So I've taken great comfort when I tune into my church's small parish's YouTube channel and I see 174 people are watching and I'm like, I'm part of something real. It's like the mystical body. Uh, I've always believed we believe in the communion of saints. And now I've got this communion of people I can't see that we're all worshiping together at the same time. And I guess 
rather than just suspicion. I guess I, I'm also filled with a little bit of hope, but the kind of eschatological hope, if you will, that there's some sort of end. And I guess that's that's another piece I would kind of add to that. What other ideas, what other sort of elements can we draw from this strange sp spirit of separation? Thank you. All right, dear friends. Uh, that is the end of our time together. Um, there's some information in the group chat, but the last thing I want to do is to thank uh, Karen and Katie for their time with us. I want to thank you uh, for the questions and, and your, uh, the engagement that you had. There's a lot of great questions that Warren answered, and I, perhaps we can take them up, at least some of them in some way, next week. Um, next week, uh, we will be hosting a kind of twin version of this seminar, though we'll be taking up in, in the question of the forgotten devotional life. Um, that devotional life, once integral to co-responsibility, was often marginalized after some of the reforms of the Second Vatican Council. What can we learn from this devotional life, from devotions, from, uh, for, for the work of co-responsibility? And so next week's panel, we'll have Dr. John Cavadini, Dr. Maria Morrow, and uh, the author, uh, Anna Nussbaum Keating. So we uh, are looking forward to seeing you there, uh, but otherwise have a lovely uh, week, everyone. Uh, and we'll see you, that, that's next Wednesday for, at 3.30 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Thanks. <laughs>